Good evening, everyone, and welcome to my show, A Fireside Chat. This is your host, Lance White, also known as the Zany Mystic. This is the first night in our new time slot, so if you tuned in to hear Dr. Bell, his new time is going to be Friday at 6 o'clock p.m. <clears throat> I'm delighted to have a wonderful guest who's been on the show with me before, John Hogue. During these times, interest in prophecy is at an all-time high with Mayan and Hopi prophecy, Edgar Casey and others. John is the preeminent authority on Michel de, Mo de <laughs> not Montaigne, that's another show, Michel de Nostre Dame and the Collective Prophetic Traditions. Hogue's documented predictive track record into the new millennium has achieved an accuracy surpassing 80%. Uh, over the 20-year period, he's written 12 books with his latest called Nostradamus, The War with Iran, now available as an e-book. So let's get John out here to join us before we all go mad or shift gears into another dimension. Hi, John. Welcome back. How are you tonight? Oh, I'm doing great, Lance. <laughs> well, I am, too. Uh, you know, I've been reading your <clears throat> latest book, which links the quatrains to the current conflicts in the Middle East. And uh, I have to say, you make a compelling, uh, compelling case. Uh, is, is, and it's very well written, by the way. And I, you. you know, I really like the pictures. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a picture person. <laughs> so am I. <laughs> um, you've, anyway, you've done an excellent job. Um, before we uh, dive into all of this stuff, maybe you could just give people a, a snapshot of who Michelle uh, de Nostradam was. Michelle de Nostradam lived in 1503 and died in. 1566, uh, during in the French Renaissance, he lived in South France in Provence. He uh, was a phys physician and uh, did his prophecy work on the side. Uh -huh. And he was born of a Christianized Jewish family, and uh, a lot of Jewish mystical practices were involved in his work. Um, but he seemed to be a his uh, his doorway to the beyond, to visions of the future, came in a rather a mix of an amalgam of different traditions. Mm -hmm. I've never actually seen anyone in all my studies of prophetic traditions or prophets through history. I've never seen anybody who took a little of this, a little dab of that, and mixed it all together in his own unique bag, as uh -huh. Nostradamus did. I mean, he did a lot of Neoplatonist uh, ritual divination. Uh, he also seemed to do things related to the keys of Solomon, uh, Jewish tradition. Mm. Uh, he had, uh, there are quotes in his books which show that he had some understanding of Chaldean, the Syrian, and um, uh, demoniacal magic as well as white magic, uh -huh. although he constantly uh, publicly denounced black magic. Uh, and uh, he had to, of course, uh, do many things, uh, cover himself in his writings uh, so that he would not be uh, taken down by the Inquisition, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which when he succeeded in, in one of his most famous prophecies, and that is the uh, prediction of the current king, Henry II of France, his contemporary dying in a jousting accident, he made that prophecy in the first volume of his predictions, his history of the future, called Le Prophetier in the Prophecies, and uh, that was in 1555. The event happened in 1559, and uh, the night that the king died, uh, Nostradamus was safely hundreds of miles away in South France when it <laughs> happened, but a mob of people thronged before the gates of the offices of the Inquisition. Huh. and demanded that they burn. They were burning Nostradamus in effigy. They demanded they burn him in, literally. Wow. So uh, it was one of the things that made him withhold his pen for so long from writing prophecies because of the harm it might do, uh, not only to his near family and mm. to himself, because of uh, people's uh, particular... Uh, uh, expectations being thwarted, you know, if they were to see how different the future would appear to their their 
their dreamland sensibilities of what religion, politics, and things should be, that if they could see how completely changed things would become, they would damn their own future. Yeah, yeah. And he felt responsible for that. So finally, though, when, when he could see signs that showed France was about to plunge into a religious civil war, not unlike what is brewing in Iraq right now uh -huh. between Shia and Sunni, between Huguenot and Catholic, uh, French Protestant and Catholic, uh, Catholic uh, Frenchman uh, in his time. It was because of that looming danger that he decided to write his prophecies and just uh, face the music, whatever that would be. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, in his case, he died in his sleep peacefully in 1556, uh, 1566, that is. Um, a relatively well-to-do man uh, and a the talk of the courts of Europe. Hmm. Amazing. Uh, during his time, well, actually since then, <clears throat> how many of his quatrains uh, have been considered verified and fulfilled, and what years, how, how long do they extend out into our future? Well, the the last dated prediction uh, goes nearly 1,800 years ahead of our own time. In really? 3797, yeah. Wow. And that's when the sun is supposed to expand and devour the, the <laughs> orbit of Earth. Wow. And uh, what's intriguing about that theory, of course, he says that at that time, the, the race, he uses a very strange... He used to make up words that were kind of mixed of other words, and if you have enough knowledge of the Greek roots and the French roots and Latin, you, you can kind of figure out what it might meant. Because a lot of his prophecies are, are written in random codes and anagrams. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, kind of a why he called it a wild poetic uh, fever. <laughs> um, and the, is he talks about the races. The asonographies, he calls them, uh, of man will, will long have since left, and they will live in Aquarius for, for a, a, a while, but they will live in Cancer for time immemorial huh. and, uh, and in perpetuity. And the statement, the way he applies the terms Aquarius and Cancer, it's as if he's talking about them as being places, huh. not... Uh, not astrological signs, which means, I, I presume to say that that means stars, star systems in Aquarius, and for a longer time, uh, apparently the colonies in Aquarius don't go over very well or don't last uh -huh. but, and go into a dead end, but the ones in Cancer, in the constellation of Cancer, apparently uh, the human race goes on. Huh and reaches some kind of immortality, as, as, at least as far as the immortality of the cosmos goes, because they've broken free of, of just being on one planet. Hmm. Um, do, do his prophecies dovetail at all into the Mayan calendar or into those of Edgar Cayce as well? Well, they, they do in, in, uh, in as much as they have Nostradamus fixating uh, uh, as much as many others have on the new millennium uh -huh. but um, the the thing about the thing about that this is a fad that's been around a long long time in prophecy and and certainly it has gained a, a renaissance of interest uh, with the year 2000 entering the 21st century and mm -hmm. um, I like to call it a, a in what you might call in prophecy chicken littleism <laughs> and it's basically the idea that on some specific date, doom or the end of man is supposed to happen, or a new age is supposed to ha uh, begin uh -huh. on a specific date in a specific calendar, uh, translated into our modern calendar to be December 2012, or as we had one before May 5th, 2000, or was supposed to see uh, the Earth tilt on its axis about 40 degrees, it didn't. Mm. Um, many people thought the year 2000 or 2001 would be the end of things. In yeah, fact, very right. interesting right. Um, prophecy from the Egyptian, ancient Egyptians and Babylonians said that September 2001 was supposed to be the end of the world. Now, what I as an interpreter of prophecy would say is that sometimes you, you get it right that something important is happening mm -hmm. but 
but uh, the ego tends to turn vision into a, a thing of hyperbole anyway. So mm, sure. um, uh, a lot of times it's exaggerated to what it really would be. Mm -hmm. It's interesting how a number of people pin, pinpoint, a number of traditions pinpointed what would be September of 2001 as the end. But it's certainly an end of an age. And who knows, maybe when we look back at how things transpired, the, the, uh, the, the events that happened in September 11th, uh, 2001, may very well be a benchmark, a milestone, where we never go back to a... Uh, we're not quite clear what kind of an era we're in now, mm -hmm. but it would seem that there's something to it that uh, some, some major shift happened, which just so happened to correspond with uh, a beginning of what will probably later be called the Great Third World War of Terrorism. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as to really answer your question about 2012, yeah. um, I think that, uh, that Nostradamus was not so specific about 2012 as such because it's really not... Um, it's really not specific to a, you don't uh, go to sleep one uh, night and wake up in a new age. It's just like you don't go to sleep one night and wake up uh, a young man turned into an old man the next day. Uh -huh. I mean, the natural span of time and history, just like life, is it's gradual. Although there's certainly some catastrophism to shake things up in that uniformism and, and what Nostradamus did do, and as I show in the book Nostradamus, The War with Iran, uh, he, there, he seems to be fingering in timeline uh, points of time, a cluster, uh -huh. using astro astrological predictions that happen to be about a number of important signs that are taking place right now in the last few years. For the time when a war, the West would prepare a great war mm -hmm. on the Near East, and I, in the book, show where there indeed has been plans not only to attack Iraq, but, but Iran um, has also been on the agenda of Acts 1 and 2 of a, of a wider program kind of, of born by the neoconservative movement that rose into stature after the Cold War, mm -hmm. basically... Uh, uh, took one of America's long-term enemies away. I mean, they were literally writing papers in 1992, of which Dick Cheney, the current vice president, was an editor of the earliest manifestos in 1992. Uh, basically saying, well, we're going to have to, uh, now that the Soviet Union is gone, we're going to have to still remain aggressively involved and engaged and deal with what we feel are the future major enemies for America because they sit across um, our our oil reserves, our quote unquote, you know that, that they belong to us. That we need them. We know how to use them better than the other big people. And right. and and you know, there's a there's a certain truth to all that. And uh, certainly, the d unstable or dictatorial powers that were running, that are astride all the richest and easier easiest to uh, drill oil fields in the world is is something, for better or worse, that, that's going to pull the West into some kind of conflict with those regimes that are over those oil fields. Uh -huh. uh, well, beyond the right and wrong of it, that that is what's happening. And I would say that even though uh, America has got itself stuck in the tar pits of Iraq and may soon jump into a deeper tar pit with Iran, Maybe as soon as uh, this coming October, uh, and I'll explain why in a moment, okay. um, but that uh, if the rest of the world doesn't think they're going to be pulled in, if there's a war with Iran and this thing becomes a America versus a, an unraveling region where all the oil of the world comes, most of it comes from the cheapest parts, when the only stable area of large resources of oil that will be left will be Russia and um, Venezuela, and uh, when there's a possibility of a, a economic alliance or boycott of America for doing this, it might see Americans uh, lose 60% of its imports uh, because of this war. 
Yeah, it, it, it's and Europe as well. Everybody disrupted. Yes, everybody's going to get involved, whether they want to or not, in the Middle Eastern problem. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, now, there's a very important prophecy that you've probably noticed several times coming up in the book on Iran that uh, talks about a calamitous war under cancer. Mm -hmm. Now, um, that is a, a, it's, a, it's Quatrain 24 in the sixth volume or century of Nostradamus' prophecies. And in it, a, it, it seems to indicate, at least in my mind, that uh, it's a double entendre, which is something Nostradamus loved to do. It's um, a, a war under cancer doesn't mean the disease, it's astrological. Well, under cancer means cancer stands for somebody. What country is ruled by the sign of cancer? And what leader of a country simultaneous is ruled by the sign of cancer? America. Hmm. The, it is a fact that Mars, which can be the, the harbinger of new beginnings, and new enterprise mm -hmm. is most of the time used because we mostly use our astrological sources of our cosmic forces in unconscious ways, collectively unconscious ways. Mm -hmm. It's probably a a sign for war. Um, so a ruinous war under Cancer. Mars is entering Cancer a few days after Yom Kippur, mm -hmm. which is the 22nd of September. There is, as my book showed, uh, a whole story that's not being told by the mainstream news that mm -hmm. shows that the Israeli leadership is being as outrageous in its statements as the Iranian leadership, which is publicized in America. Right, right. But what you really have is two sides that are equally saying outrageous things against each other. And you then add to that, just recently, a, a ramp up, a ratcheting up of the apocalyptic uh, rhetoric of our own president when he talks about nuclear holocaust if Iran pursues its atomic aspirations. Well, it's a strange phrase to use because even if Iran had one bomb, mm -hmm. the real and even if they were stupid enough to use it against Israel, Israel has at least 500 nuclear and thermal nuclear weapons. Yeah. And, and I mean, you know, just one crude nuclear device going off in Tel Aviv um, will, the, in 20 minutes, Iran will cease to exist. Right. So, so when the president starts talking about nuclear holocaust, in the lingo that's very reminiscent of, of uh, the vice president's rhetoric, uh -huh. When you know that it's very interesting who has been leaving the, the White House uh, cabinet of late or being marginalized. And first, I'll begin with the marginalized people. You have uh, Condi Rice, the Secretary of State, who scarcely you ever see anymore. He's right, right. And Negroponte, who used to run was the security czar, suddenly left that job to become some undersecretary of Condoleezza Rice. Hmm. What what I noticed is they have one thing in common. They have been consistently against the policy of military options for Iran. Hmm. Karl Rove uh, has yesterday officially left his job as the president's political advisor, mm -hmm. uh, as well as foreign relations. He was also involved in the committee involved in that. He also, it appears, uh, was not very hot on the idea of striking Iran. Huh. Well, that's kind of surprising. Uh, Snow. Tony Snow I, uh, is the the press secretary. Mm -hmm. I just, I have a hard time believing what I consider a rather lame excuse that he's leaving because he wants to make more money to put his kids through school. Well, wasn't he making $168,000 a year? Yeah, and I'm sure he has stocks and things like that. I mean, it's, it's, it's that was a, yeah, that I had very trouble with that one myself. And I, I I don't know why he left. I don't think the reason he gives is, is the reason. But I sometimes wonder because I think Snow is. If I don't uh, always agree with what he has to say, but I think he's very sincere. Yeah, he um, seems that way. I don't think he wanted to be the man explaining to the American people 
why we struck Iran. Yeah. yeah. In October. Yeah. If, or in the next six months. Yeah. And and wasn't it strange that uh, the, the, that uh, Gonzalez actually caved in? I thought he was going to grit, grit his teeth and, and hang on like a dog to uh, somebody's uh, leg. Yeah, it's. Uh, I don't know if there's any Iran connection with that, but uh, it may very well be that um, with what's coming, the White House didn't want to have too many potential scandals to deal with, so mm -hmm. just diffuse it. You know, best way to. Uh, you know, it's 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 old news. Uh, if you want to keep dragging in why those prosecutors were fired, yeah. uh, it sort of would be uh, politically stupid for the Democrats to continue to dig that up because the man that they wanted to take down is down. So, and uh, there's also some of that involved with the connections with the Valerie Plame Plem, uh, conspiracy dealing with uh, Scooter Libby, mm -hmm. Dick Cheney's Carl Rove, basically. Um, his political consultant and the connections they might have had with Karl Rove, it's almost like it might lead to exposing something that's going on with the plan with Iran. And so, you know, a lot of this I go into in my book, uh, Nostradamus, the war, the war with Iran. I, I basically, the book tries to uh, keep it within the focus of, of the prophecies of Nostradamus, the fact that he talked a lot about Persia and mm -hmm. about what later became Israel and how it was key and that these dates are lining up for a window in time in the early part of the 21st century where something big is going to happen related to this and it often has in the metaphors uh, about stars falling from the skies or or long comets a uh, strange thing to call a comet long unless you're trying to explain as a 16th century man the shaft of a regional ballistic missile <laughs> yes. uh, with a big fiery tail. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Or if you uh, talk about there'll be a comet that falls with a trail of sparks, uh, you know, that's, that's interesting. Yeah. And then there's the old double entendre of uh, the fact that we have had uh, in January appearance to the naked eye of the most the most one of the most beautiful comets certainly one of the brightest in 60 years comet McNaught which became visible the very day that uh, Saddam Hussein was hung oh really and it's it, to the Nostradamus scholars out there and people who like to play sleuth prophecy sleuth uh, they know that for 20 years now, I've been saying that uh, Saddam Hussein is the, the chief candidate for Nostradamus' enigmatic mobus, M-A-B-U-S, who uh -huh. uh, may be the third Antichrist huh. in his prophecies, the final Antichrist. And, you know, it's supposed to, he's supposed to soon die, and then there's a terrible destruction of people and animals after his death. It's actually his death, or, or the event of his death, is a marker for when the real war starts unlike the other two antichrists, and it happens when a comet will pass. Well, there's a comet tonight at 4-something uh, in the morning. Well, the thing is, the thing is, there are comets, there are comets out there all the time. Right. And like Comet Neat, got, I had a lot of letters to hoagprophecy.com, to my bulletins I even had to write. I write these free bulletins about twice a week. Uh, it's kind of a quasi-blog bulletin article journalistic article about the current events and how they relate to prophecy uh from a agnostic or trans dogmatic point of view right so i embrace all the different prophecies of different religions and and uh rather than one dogmatic line exactly and the in the hope and anybody can join hope prophecy bulletins by just going to my website and clicking on uh and uh, you get these these notices to look at these articles and I love receiving them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's really great. Well, it's not Comet Neat, I did it. I had to do something on Comet Neat, and you can read it in the archives uh, at hopeprophecy.com. And it's important to read because in it, I try to explain to people that we, ha we what often happens to people trying to understand where Nostradamus is coming from is that we try to not understand him from our own understanding. 
we assume he thinks like us. We don't consciously do this, but it, uh, you often catch yourself in the in the act of doing it. Um, you know, when we see some neat, interesting <laughs> excuse the pun, the pun, but uh, some interesting comet, uh, and we're talking all about it, and we're seeing it in our binoculars and our telescopes, we forget that Nostradamus, being a 16th century man, would only be interested in comets that you see with a naked eye. Right. That are huge, that are, you know, significant, like Comet Haley or the Comet of 1812 or, mm. or Comet McNaught. Uh, so, or Hale Bopp was the last mm. uh, candidate in 1997. But this, this one coming early this year and becoming visible early this year was absolutely spectacular in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, sending off this this, or, this aurora-like uh, rooster tail that went out millions of miles into space. It's one of the most beautiful people. If, if you want to go and search pictures of it, it's really one of the prettiest comets I've ever seen. Uh -huh. So it's, it's very significant, and um, it, the fact that it happened to appear to the naked eye when the chief candidate for 20 years for Mobus was hung is significant in prophecy and so now we wait to see that in the next in this year or next year if if some huge escalation in conflicts be, begins and it would seem that we're kind of heading towards that well, now who are the people behind this uh, neocon agenda and uh, you mentioned PNAC and then there's uh, NAFTA as well which is running under the radar and it's uh, set to start up uh, I think about September 1st Labor Day weekend that they're going to start trucking things from Mexico well you know this back in back in 1994 I wrote uh, an essay in my book the Millennium Book of Prophecy where I looked at collective prophecies of the first half of the book was about doomsday and then I contradicted all those visions with visions of bloomsday <laughs> and uh, and kind of uh, offered, uh, challenged the reader to realize that you seize which timeline of the future, you give birth to it with your actions in the only time that really matters, that really exists, the huh. eternity of the present. I like that. And, and so, and one is empowered to do something individually and collectively in the eternity of the present. Wow. So... So, with that said, there was um, a lot of indications that, uh, in, a, in an essay I called it, there's a dark side to Aquarius, the Aquarian age. You know, uh, during the early 90s, it seems like everybody saw it as a panacea for all good things that are going to happen. We just had to kind of look the other way, hide out, not change, not do anything, and wait for some phenomenal new age to, you know, uh, to... I don't know, uh, spike the atmosphere like yeah. in days of the comet of H.G. Wells, and, and, and suddenly everybody snapped out of it, and we're all living in, in space alien dolphin heaven, you know. <laughs> or for the Christians, it would be the rapture. Yeah, and, and it's really the same kind of idiocy in another more New Age guise. Mm -hmm. But, but the, the uh, you know, why I want to caution people is that the Aquarian Age is much more than that. It's, it has its positive sides, and it has its dark challenges as well. Mm -hmm. And um, you know the the idea of mass mind control. Um, the you know Aquarius rules the atmosphere, so the main source of change in the world, for better or worse, is in the atmosphere of the electric, the the even electromagnetic, the mm. microwavic. You know, it is mm. about. It is about the Aquarian okay. age. Is about you with your cell phone up against your head. Uh, you know, it's about you. If there really is an antichrist, at least the way I see the antichrist, he's not going to be some heroically insane fellow in, in a, with a funny armband and a mustache. He's, he's or he's, he's not going to be something that would would give awe and inspiration to somebody who lived two thousand years ago. He's going to be a guy who plays with ones and zeros. Hmm. He's going to be uh, somebody who doesn't control the world through politics, but he controls the world of information. Hmm. And not only the world of information, but he 
go, he, if he's a he or if he's a, even a, an ego personified, mm -hmm. he's going to be trying to uh, change the way you view information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He will con he will uh, condition you mm -hmm. to have a short term memory. He will condition you to be from from a saver of your wealth to a consumer. Mm -hmm. He will he will convince you to go buy a house that you can't afford. Yeah. Uh, so that then you're in hock and under his power. Uh huh. And and the, the fact ultimately is he's not even a person. He is a force in all of us. Yeah. It's yeah. unconsciousness. And, you know, the human race is, is this unique first animal on the planet that has enough sentience to actually break from the collective evolution to individual transformation. Mm -hmm. And, of course, once this happens, the, un the forces of the, m the big machine that runs this country, Gaia, I mean, runs the world, this huge organism, uh, which is constantly mechanically trying to find balance, and if something goes out of whack, it eradicates it through natural means, through plagues, things like this. Mm -hmm. Well, the human race is somewhere caught in the in the, the machinery, and its consciousness is, is an anomaly to the unconscious machine of the Earth and the Earth system, the Earth body-mind, if you like. Uh -huh. And it's, it's not a question of right or wrong. It simply eradicates all those things that are anomalies. Because they are, they compute mindlessly to imbalance. That sounds uh, quite a bit like the Matrix. Well, yes, actually, the, I, I, there are a handful of movies throughout cinema history that I consider works of prophecy, and I will eventually comment and give my two cents on movie reviews from a prophetic angle, uh -huh. and list some of the movies that actually uh, will will be looked back upon as not just entertainment, but actually works of visionary prophecy. And uh, actually, the Wachowski brothers have come up with two <laughs> movie, uh, well, a trilogy plus V is for v Vengeance. For, yeah, V for Vendetta. For Vendetta. Yeah. V is for Vendetta. <laughs> yeah. And these are... these are works of prophetic cinema. Oh, absolutely. I totally agree with that one. You know, um, in, in a similar way... Francois Truffaut's uh, adaptation of Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451 mm -hmm. uh, has more to do with our kind of, you know, the whole George Orwell concept of 1984, kind of like Stalin run amok and taking over the world, was something you could understand at the opening stages of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. But I think Bradbury's book captured something more close to the more subtle danger is you will have this completely affluent consumerist society that's, that's staring in front of wall-sized TVs, like flat, flat screen TVs, mm -hmm. and they've lost their, their souls into this, and they don't even know anymore. They've become so fundamentally phony that they don't even know how to feel anymore mm -hmm. or know things or even... And here's through he uses the medium of books, and you know in those days they're so advanced and affluent that they the houses don't burn anymore. They're so a fireman is now not a person who puts out fires in houses, but he burns books mm -hmm. because books are considered antisocial. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it's also a society completely short-term memory loss. Uh, into its entertainment, to completely distracted, that's about to fight a nuclear war. And it doesn't even seem to know or care. Mm. And in the book, actually, unlike the movie, the nuclear war happens. Uh, but in the movie, Francois Truffaut uh, changed it. And I, I know Ray Bradbury. He was one of my first mentors. I met him once. And he, oh, wow. He even read one of my first stories and helped me and He's just a wonderful man and very inspiring to young writers. And uh, I remember him telling me that that, um, that uh, Truffaut and him used to be on the phone. This was before Bradbury could, could speak fluent French, and Truffaut didn't speak English, and they were uh -huh. trying to express... They couldn't really understand each other's languages, so they had to kind of somehow do it from the heart. Uh -huh. And Truffaut then, in, in that 
in that realm, uh, wrote this beautiful adaptation with Oscar Werner and Julie Christie, and and then it was one of Bernard Herrmann's last, most most haunting scores. He used to do a lot of Albert Hitchcock, and and um, of course, my one of my favorites was The Ghost in Mrs. Muir. Oh yeah, that's he, a great one. He did the music for that. Well, and, what about Bradbury's Illustrated Man? Well, you know. Ray didn't like that at all. What they did to it, he was pretty. He said, "He said I just stepped back and let the whole thing collapse in a heap." <laughs> uh, he really, uh, although I, I kind of like what Rod Steiger did. I'm a big Rod Steiger fan. So I like, I like that movie. I'm uh, sorry. Ever since I saw him in uh, in Doctor Zhivago, you uh -huh. know, when I was a kid, and I, then I couldn't get enough of Rod Steiger wherever. I, and then I, I thought he did a fantastic Napoleon. Uh, in Waterloo, yeah, uh, Russian-Italian yeah. production from the same guy who did the amazing battle sequences uh, in the Russian version of War and Peace, which is probably the last movie in history that will have that many extras in one <laughs> shot. 120,000. Know, three cool. divisions of the Soviet Union all dressed up in Napoleonic garb. Wow. Uh, but uh, anyway, we're we're... We're going all over the place. <laughs> no, <that's laughs> all right. But I don't think anybody minds. <laughs> we can do that. Yeah. <laughs> Who says we can't? Uh, you know, this is this is the freedom of the information revolution. Exactly. The watercourse way. Exactly. I think it makes things interesting. You know, in fact, I was trying to find out a way to segue into your experiences, uh, your spiritual experiences with uh, Rajneesh or Osho. And um, I couldn't figure out how I was going to do that, so now you've opened the door. <laughs> well, Osho loved, Osho loved Dr. Shivago very much. He did. And he liked the Russian version of War and Peace. In fact, before Osho left his body, he saw Dr. Shivago three times. I really? Know that. Yeah, he loved that film. What can you tell us about him? He's such an enigma, you know, with his Rolls Royces, and, and <laughs> I think he's brilliant myself. I mean... You, you just can't write 50,000 spiritual books that, in such depth without being an awakened conscious being. Yeah, he, 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 he never actually wrote a book. He spoke off the cuff, spontaneously, and, wow. but it all came out like he had taken hours to write it. And wow. he, the, 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 the tally is around over 700 books. Good night. And <laughs> half of them are still in Hindi. Wow. But he, he used to do a discourse uh, for a time in the late 70s, early 80s. He would do a, uh, every other discourse would be in Hindi and in English, Hindi and English. And his grasp of English was masterful, as, and, but it's also remarkable to hear him speak in Hindi, wow. his mother tongue, um, because it's such a poetic language. And I'm told from the Indian disciples that whenever he would start telling stories, he would always capture the dialect of whoever was, you know, what caste or what corner of India. And that alone wow. used to make them just crack up. Uh, he was very funny. And uh, it kind of, you might call Osho the Jack Benny of gurus. <laughs> he had this very dry, straight face uh -huh. way of saying things that were very funny. Oh, yeah. Um, you know the um, one of the funnier ones that I recall was, uh, and I, actually that pulled me to him more than it when I was seeking proof. I, I had been an opera singer, groomed to be an opera singer. I was I probably, you know, everybody thought I was going to have quite a great career. I was kind of what you would call an opera a child prodigy, oh. which is an eighteen-year-old. <laughs> it's an older man's sport. That's like being a child in opera, eighteen or twenty. Oh, yeah. And I was like doing Madame Butterfly as a lead baritone at, at 21, and wow. I, I was trying to play 45, and the 45-year-old soprano was trying to play 15. You know, <laughs> I had an easier time of it, <laughs> but uh, with makeup. But uh, the uh, I was pulled into that, and then then I realized that I just didn't. I loved to sing, but I didn't like the politics, and I also felt like I was being pulled to something more solitary in uh -huh. my creative life and just more in. And so I left, suddenly just left. And rather shattering breakthrough in the process. I was just 21. And I then began to search. Uh, I was compelled to search and devour whatever I could to understand. And 
I, I, I suppose what uh, I did in about three, four years is find a real masterful way to paint a picture of rice cakes, hmm. which means that uh, I think I think many of the people listening out there can understand that there's there's a I, I would even say one of the best examples of, of of a picture of a rice cake is this current fad with what the bleep do I know? Uh huh. I mean, all wonderful stuff. You know, just just a wonderful way of expressing all kinds of amazing mystical truths, <laughs> but but completely in the head. Yeah, it is not a look. I can I can describe to you, or I can even paint for you the most beautiful painting you'll ever see of water. It might even be more beautiful than what actual water looks like. Uh. But a person like Osho, it, he might draw you in through his words, but if you get close enough, this is the kind of guy that will grab you by the collar and throw you in the water. Hmm. You won't talk about it anymore. You have to swim in it. You have to, have to feel its wetness. You have to feel drown in it. You have to flow with it. And suddenly the whole issue of making a pretty word out of this experience called water is just like you can look back at that and say that's kindergarten stuff. I mean, uh -huh. that's like if that can satisfy the spiritually minded intellectual. Mm. But if you really have reached the point where what the bleep do I know is not just a nice, cute intellectual statement, but an absolute shattering from your head to your toe that I really don't know. Hmm. You know, I don't know who I am. I don't know what this world's about. Mm -hmm. Got a whole lot of people telling me this and that, but in the deep interiority of my being, I feel this shattering of it is not any of it is really telling the truth or knows. Mm -hmm. And and that can be a real alone crisis filled space to be in. It's an existential crisis. Mm -hmm. And you know when when that happens to someone, that's when. The search really begins, and if you know, there's the old statement that says that um, you 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 don't actually seek a master; a master seeks you. Mm -hmm. um, the the thing that and each individual has to experience this. I can tell you this story, and it's a nice story, but unless it happens to you, you don't know if what I'm saying is true or not. Mm -hmm. But when I went through this process of, of disseminating all this stuff, the day that I that it dawned on me that I answered all the fundamental questions that I'd been seeking, uh, rather than have a breakthrough, it was almost like a breakdown. Mm. So suddenly this feeling of, I feel so completely dead and phony. Mm. Yeah, I've got the I've got this picture of a rice cake, but I I'm trying to eat it and it doesn't nourish me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's the most beautiful. It's using the Zen term. You know, people who make pictures of rice cakes. A lot of people who are into spiritual mumbo jumbo uh, or into intellectual spiritual candy ca uh, games. Right. Right. Uh, is it, it, at a certain point. I mean, that's all cool. We all do it. It's great. But at a certain point, you go. I'm tired of eating this paper picture of rice cakes. Mm -hmm. I want the real rice cake. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, then often what happens is that you end up. The master calls you. Hmm. And it doesn't mean he's saying hello, John. Are you there? It's it's. It's uh, much more subtle than that. But basically what happened was that I was pulled like a magnet to India. Huh. I knew that I couldn't go any further in this work with my own understanding of things. But right. I saw that my understanding was no understanding. Right. I had at least that much understanding. So um, that seemed to lead me into, you know, I stumbled across Osho's picture and and his book called Only One Sky. Huh. And, and I thought, what an amazing phrase. Only one sky. That just hit me. It might not hit anybody the same way, uh -huh. but it hit me. And then I wanted to find this fellow, and, and I felt like he was actually calling me to come to be with him. So uh -huh. I went. And... With, and I went at a time when a lot of people were still getting over Jonestown. 
Oh, yeah. And and the whole thing, oh, cults and cult gurus and all of that. Tell me any real guru in his contemporary times that isn't called by the mainstream religions and political establishments a cult guru. Well, yeah, you know, I'm thinking there's that cult leader in, from, from Galilee called Yeshua that later people twisted into a, na a phony name called Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. There was that guy who said all Brahmin, that anybody could be a Brahmin, which was a c complete heresy in Hinduism. You know, the guy that everybody was expecting to bring back fundamentalist Hinduism, he was even foreseen a thousand years before he came to be born in Bihar mm -hmm. as the next avatar of Hinduism. Ends up throwing Hinduism on its ear. Mm -hmm. You know, cult guru, Gautama Buddha, that was... You know, you if you look at the history of mystics, certainly it's dangerous to go seek a master because you might run into a Jim Jones. <laughs> that's, it's that's, dangerous. That's exactly what happened to me. I I read uh, Meetings with Remarkable Men by George Gurdjieff, and then I read some of Aspensky, and I just had to find a, an esoteric school. Yep. And I ended up in a cult in Northern California in an esoteric school uh, called the Fellowship of Friends. And, uh, you know, I don't regret it, but uh, there are people that are still in that school today and making that person, they're quite wealthy. So, well, let's go back to Osho. What, mm -hmm. uh, did you go to India then to, to be with Osho? Yeah, I went to, to meet him and take discipleship wow. in 1980. Wow. And... Uh, it was uh, when he was still actually personally giving disciplehood. Of course, <laughs> one of his statements it was that, uh, you know, you, yeah. In the old days, you had to wait like 20, 30 years for it to happen. He says, look, I just give it to you and then so that you can relax and then it will happen later. <laughs> so, in all accuracy, I can't say that I've had the initiation yet. <laughs> but, uh, you know, Osho was uh, kind of trying to break from the past, the entire past. Yeah. And one of the ways that he did that was to, I don't know if there's ever been a mystic that has commented on every angle of the spiritual search. Uh. I mean, he had books on Hasidism, Sufism. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, he, he even uh, dealt with Blavatsky and her people as yeah. well as all the Zen masters. All the Hindu masters, yep. Buddhist, his Dhammapada series, yep. which he took a whole year to do, is remarkable on Buddha. A very unusual take on Buddha, which, yeah, yeah. You know, one of my favorite takes that he had about Buddha is how the Buddhists are fundamentally seeing it upside down. That that if they really want to become Buddhas, they should do what Gautama Siddhartha did, as they should live life totally hedonistically, grab the brass ring. Get all the things that you think are going to make your life full, and and then you might, at a certain point, if you have a certain spiritual intelligence, mm. uh, suddenly look at your life and say, and run off into the forest, <laughs> just like he did, you know, just like, well, I don't feel any more fulfilled with all this stuff because you know that's the story of, of Prince Siddhartha. He, his father, was given him to. Uh, an astrologer predicted two possibilities for Siddhartha, that he'd become a great world conqueror like Alexander the Great, or he would conquer himself and become a great mystic, Wow! a world teacher. Father, who was a warrior class, Kshatriyan, uh, just like Buddha wanted his son to be a warrior, so um, he, the story goes that he kept him in specific palaces for the summer and the spring and, and that he never really got to see people getting old. He, he always lived in luxury, had lots of women, wine, women, and song. Mm. Um, and at a certain point, uh, he did see somebody um, getting old and he then did, saw somebody who died and then he realized that he'd been this whole huge illusion had been created for him and he asked this charity chariot to hear chariot driver um to who had, was taking him to this youth festival and apparently uh was pulled off the road and saw things that he wasn't supposed to see like um an old old people because mm -hmm. usually whenever buddha came into town all the old people had to disappear 
Mm -hmm. And he saw this old. He said, well, "What happened to this man?" He said, "Oh, that's old age, Lord." And he said, "That's what happens to all of us." And then he saw a body being taken to the gats, to burning gats to be burned, and and he said, and "That's where we all go to." Um, and but then he saw a man in orange, a saint in a uh, sannyasin, a, a disciple of somebody, and he said, "Who's that?" Well, he's trying to seek a truth beyond all of this, uh -huh. see if there's something that divides all of this. And Buddha realized that he had to do that, and realized his whole life was illusions, um, and and then went off six years into the forest. And the point being, and Osho is trying to point out that you know the way it started now, and the Buddhist priests do the six years of solitude and ascetism, and try to suppress all the other things, and that is. That's not what Buddha did, so why is the Buddhist religion following the opposite of what Buddha did? Right, right. So, I mean, he came up with a concept. I mean, one of the things in, in a prophetic angle that is as significant about Osho in the topic of prophecy is that he, was, he like Gurdjieff and Spensky and, and uh, Aurobindo and a few other 20th century mystics, Christian mm. Murray, were all shared uh, a vision of a new humanity that will have to come to balance the situation that we have now with mm -hmm. a humanity that's kind of crystallized in its old habits to a point where it might self-destruct mm -hmm. and take mm -hmm. the world with it mm -hmm. in many various ways. And certainly that has been in pro prophetic literature since the first prophet saw our future thousands of years ago. And what I think people like Osho did was uh, give a much clearer understanding of what exactly this new man, this new humanity could be like and how we actually give birth to that new humanity by living in the eternity of the pre present because that humanity in the future does the same. Mm -hmm. and so if there's a bridge to this utopia, it is in completely with our, in our power to w awaken that new humanity in ourselves and mm -hmm. in something I call kind of a, you know, another kind of revolutionary provocation, if you will. And it's, a, it's a path that I try to follow and understand, and that is, and it's been through the grace of meditating and learning Osho's techniques of meditation that I've come to understand that, you know, we usually see things in our world, I would pose to you, upside down from the way they really are. Yep. Yeah, and and one of the things that we constantly do is uh, to give an example is if you love me, I'll be happy. Mm. You know, if I'm rich, I will be fulfilled. Mm -hmm. If I get my dreams fulfilled, and I will be fulfilled. But here's the radical turnaround that I propose to your audience: What if you just simply were fulfilled without a reason? Mm. No reason whatsoever. In fact, in the face of a million reasons not to feel fulfilled. Now, you know, what if you simply became the love you're seeking through the arms of other friends and other people uh -huh. and the respect and the attention of, of others? What if you became free of that bondage and mm -hmm. simply were the love that you can't have unless uh, some people give it to you or things get better or you're happier. What if you just, just said no to all that and just simply were available to being love and fulfillment of love without any, any uh, effect? Hmm. I mean, or cause. It would be, if I call it effectless cause. Uh, uh, or cause, rather than cause and effect, is just effect without a cause. Mm. Well, this sounds remarkably similar to Werner Earhart's S trainings. Yes, except that, except that, uh, that's a picture of a rice cake <laughs> of what I'm saying. <laughs> just yeah. like the secret. Right. Oh, yeah. yeah. Nice picture of a rice cake, and so affordable too. Oh, yeah. You don't have to change a thing. You know, it's and 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 I predict in two years it'll be forgotten and yeah. some new rice cake. Oh, yeah. In picture, new, better, and different. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, so you know, to 
to a majority of people, that's fine for them. Uh-huh. But if if you are a real seeker of something, that you're ready to, it's a life and death situation. Yeah, you have to find out because it's it's like this. Um, uh, I mean, you just have to find out. You have to find out who you are and what it all is, and it's and it's like you're ready to go all the way. And you know, a lot of people who buy into these things are not ready yet. They have not gotten uh, and fed up enough with the way things are and yeah. the way they themselves are. And and that's what I love about the cinema a metaphor of Neo in The Matrix. Mm-hmm. The Matrix is a cinematic science fiction construct that is really a metaphor for our lives. We are living in the Matrix called robotic unconscious behavior mm-hmm. programmed by a society that just so happened, didn't, nobody decided it really. No intelligent person would have decided to make it the way it is. It just sort of fell into place mm-hmm. that every child that's born is in, in, in print, imprinted with, with uh, seeds of the misery field of this world that keeps history repeating itself, keeps people... Um, just mindlessly borrowing knowledge or identities from others. For instance, mm-hmm. you know, if if what happened to Jesus Christ happened to Jesus Christ, that's wonderful. But some guy or or gal in a in a dress or in a religious garb as a person of authority, um, imparting that to you when clearly that that woman or that man doing it. Those priests or priestesses have not had the same experience. Mm-hmm. Have no authority to to dispense the grace that fell on Jesus in his baptism with John the Baptist. Mm-hmm. You know, it, 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 if you could at least take that, if it happened to someone like Jesus, it could happen to me if I go into my own forty days into the wilderness, mm-hmm. wherever that wilderness might be. And see myself um, like Jesus did. Mm-hmm. That's at least what I take from it. it. It, you know, whether Jesus was enlightened or not, he's not in right in front of us right now doing this. Uh, you know, only in the imagination of people that talk to higher fathers, like the President of the United States. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, the reality is, and then another reality may very well be that uh, if, if God really is, can do wonders on this earth, it may very well be that he needs our eyes unblemished, mm. our hearts unclosed, our minds uh, unobsessed, and um, it may very well be that if, if if our hand is not free to do God's work, then God's work doesn't happen here. If our minds are, are not free to think intelligently, then God is as stupid as we are. And, no, um, <laughs> you know, rather than put it on an imaginary friend outside of oneself, I think one of the fundamental mistakes of all religions seem to teach is that we always seek uh, an imaginary, we turn our own godliness into an imaginary friend that we pray to. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, we certainly have uh, gone. <clears throat> we haven't quite gone full circle, but we've certainly come close to it. <laughs> We're almost out of time. <laughs> well, we could have. We could certainly talk for hours and hours and hours. You're just one of the most fascinating people to talk to, and I just, I just love it because you have such a. Uh, refreshingly unique perspective on things, and it's. Don't you feel that people are awakening today, though, more than than have, how they have in the past? I mean, we're we're in a materialistic society, and don't you feel that uh, people are beginning to search for something more? I think uh, you know the one of the theories that's been bounced around is that um, at any one time the human population has five percent of its numbers mm. that uh, have the potential to become fully Christ or Buddha conscious. Mm. So um, so that not all of them get a chance, not all of them live in a mm. climate or a country or a place where that can happen. Mm. Um, but that is. Uh, if that's the case, then more people have the potential to become a Buddha now than mm. lived mm-hmm. in many thousands of years. 
I hadn't thought of that. That's a good so, one. so the other thing too is, as Gurdjieff used to say, often people used to say to, oh, what a shame, George Ivan Ivanovich, uh, you, you tried to set up a school in Moscow, and then World War One happened, and then you tried to rebuild it again, and then the Bolshevik Revolution happened, and then you tried to go to Paris, and then the Nazis occupied it, and it seems like every time you tried to start something, it got stuck or didn't really grow into some huge thing and uh, his common response to that was no you misunderstand you misunderstand my work you know i i need a crisis in the world because this is when people who have the potential to look at themselves are shocked into doing so wow if everything is going ozzy and harriet nelson like yeah yeah if it's all a walt going to disneyland walt uh, disney fantasy world and everybody's happy everybody falls asleep look at the 90s look at mm -hmm. the clinton bubble mm -hmm. that was a slumber time and, and and now things aren't so comfortable in mm. fact they're going to get a lot more uncomfortable in the very short future but i i side with gurdjieff on that if we're entering some very dire times it is for those who want to find out who they are who want to be that mystery that passes passes I can't say it. That's beyond understanding. Right. That that's if you want to live in the eternity of the present, that means you have to drop the the all the other stuff. And uh, what better time than when dreams are dashed and when great icons are crashed? Well, I'm going to segue into uh, having you tell people how they can get onto your site and find out more about this. <laughs> yes, Mike. My site is called uh, hogprophecy.com. That's like, hog is spelled like rogue with an H. H-O-G-U-E, P-R-O-P-H-E-C-Y.com. All one word. Wonderful. John, you've been absolutely uh, wonderful tonight. And I, I want to have you back again because I'm just, you know, it's just starting to get interesting and we have to stop. <laughs> Thank you so much for being on tonight. You're welcome. And remember what the great Vaudevillian said, leave them wanting. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks again, and good night, everybody. This has been another episode of A Fireside Chat with John Hogue, and uh, we'll be back next week, same time, same place. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, John. Bye-bye, everybody. Good night. <laughs>